good crowd. If you feel like the uh, discussion about fire and stuff, I'm going to get on that topic in here too. I can't talk about wildlife management timberland without uh, talking about fire a little bit as well. Uh, since this is the Alabama Forest Owners Association, we're going to talk about wildlife management in, a, in relation to timber management, forest land management. Um, there's not going to be anything in there about food plots and, and uh, you know, feeders and high protein and stuff like that. It's going to be all about, you know, native plant management. Um, I've got a bunch of slides and 25 minutes to get through them, so I'm going to be bumping through some of these fairly quick. The biggest thing as far as just trying to enhance wildlife opportunities in the timberland is trying to maintain a good diverse stand. If you've got 40 acres and it's all in, you know, one 10-year-old uh, log lolly stand, it's not a very diverse track, it's not going to be the greatest wildlife habitat. If you've got 40 acres and you can break it up into five or six different blocks of different ages and different species, hardwoods, pines, longleaf, log lolly, uh, you will get a lot more wildlife opportunities and a lot more wildlife use on your property. And obviously the bigger the property, the more uh, you can take advantage of, of uh, diverse tracks. This one here is a good example. One of the clients we work on, uh, and, and all the different colors are different stands, or different species of, of uh, stands. Some of it's hardwood, some of it's longleaf, some of it's log lolly. And within some of like the red, for instance, there's about five different ages of longleaf. That's the red on this, on this track. So just breaking these tracks up into a lot of different blocks uh, allows wildlife to have opportunities to find you know, what they need during each season of the year. Um, <clears throat> this is always, uh, you know, something we push a lot, or I certainly uh, uh, push a lot, is trying to maintain that open ground, that open vista look. It's not only good for wildlife, but it's good for, you know, recreational landowners as far as being able to enjoy the property, and that's just maintaining either the herbicides and burning, uh, you know, just trying to maintain a more mature timber stand that's very open underneath. Um, we'll talk about the wildlife plants that grow up underneath that, but uh, you know, aesthetics are real important to private landowners. Uh, most of y'all that, uh, that own land understand that. It's, uh, you know, enjoying the property, being able to get out there and uh, ride around and see the different views and be able to see what you got, be able to see the property that you have, uh, makes a huge amount of difference. A lot of places that we start working on, you know, growing up, there's a wall of vegetation on the side of the road. You can't see 20 yards. I, I, I kid around with a lot of these newer landowners to work with. So you may as well just bow on your property because you can't see more than 20 yards on the place. You know, and every deer you ought to be, you know, if you're shooting, you're shooting deer in a green field, you might be able to see 50. Uh, so, you know, trying to, trying to establish some of these open uh, stands is, is real important. Obviously, uh, there's a huge uh, amount of money being spent on especially deer, but uh, also just standard wildlife management, turkeys and things like that. Uh, you know, people find that uh, high on their interest list. Uh, certainly before the economy uh, ran into some trouble in 08, um, you know, there was a lot of uh, recreational land being bought and sold for really high prices, and it was being driven by the recreational market for, for deer, turkeys, and quail, stuff like that. Um, quail stuff, they're kind of a tougher species to manage. Um, people tell you you can't have wild birds. That's not true. You can grow wild birds if you, you know, manage your property correctly. Uh, but it's an expensive proposition in most cases. Maintaining a quail place can be uh, both the direct cost of establishing and maintaining that cover and also the opportunity cost in, in not having as much timber as you would carry uh, if you're managing for timber, for instance. And uh, so, uh, but they are good species for cropland and woodland systems. Uh, and the folks who do manage the quail tend to have you know, enough money to, uh, to maintain a piece of property that uh, uh, the quail owners, you know, the quail managers, uh, you know, tend to have the bigger properties and, and spend a lot of money on it. And obviously, that uh, most of these abundant wildlife populations advertise, advertise themselves. This is a picture I took a couple years ago. Uh, and, and, and that afternoon, I saw 250 turkeys on about a 100 acre field plus a little small section off to the side where I took this picture of 75 bird flock. Um, and you know, when you got these kind of numbers, um, you know, there's a whole lot of value and a whole financial value for landowners who want to sell a piece of property and run across big groups of turkeys or deer or something like that. Um, you know, there is a financial value associated with abundant wildlife populations as well. And certainly from an enjoyment standpoint, you know, you, you can uh, enjoy your property a lot more if you've got plenty of, for instance, this time of year, plenty of turkeys. You hear, you know, one turkey every three days, it's not that much fun. You hear five turkeys in the morning, it's certainly a whole lot more fun. So, we'll talk real quick about what is and what isn't wildlife habitat. Um, this one is uh, 
uh, and, and cattle farmers typically you know, don't like me being around because I, I bad mouth cattle operations all the time, especially pasture grass. I don't mind the cows, but I hate what the cows have to have to live on. Uh, these these uh, big open pasture lands are basically wildlife voids. There's, there's very little out there uh, wildlife. The, the pasture grasses are dominant, the Bahia Bermuda fescue. Uh, I couldn't tell you how many thousands of acres of that stuff I've killed over the years. Uh, trying to recover wildlife habitat and open pasture land systems. Um, and you know, there's just nothing, it, people, you know, talking about doing quail stuff, we do a lot of quail management on people's properties and we'll be out in the big Bermuda grass pasture and, and they're like, hey, you know, we used to have quail out here, you know, 20 years ago all over the place and, and I just don't know what happened to them all. And, you know, we're standing in the middle of 300 acres of Bermuda grass and, uh, and, and, you know, it takes a little while for folks to pick up on the fact that, you know, they established a big pasture and put an invasive grass species on it. Uh, but there's no food value for deer in those pastures and turkeys. You know, turkeys use a pasture, but uh, it's you know, certainly not the best thing in the world for them. Uh, timber management. There, there's, a, there's a whole lot lacking in a lot of timber managed properties. Uh, you know, thick overstories. As long as you can't get sunlight on the ground and grow, you know, weedy vegetation, it's poor wildlife habitat in general. Um, you know, any of these pictures here, if, uh, if a deer wants to, you know, uh, live out there and, and come through a stand like this, you better pack a lunch because there's nothing for me out there. Uh, even shady hardwood stands are often like that. Um, again, if you look at a stand like this, the only time that stand of timber has any wildlife value to speak of, or at least for deer, turkeys, and quail, the most you know, the more important species that people spend time and effort on, is when the acres drop. And in the summertime, when this picture was taken, there's nothing out there. It's a void of food and really a void of cover. It's a, you know, it's a beautiful stand and open hardwoods are gorgeous and fun to hunt in, but you know, there's, there's very little food in there. And again, that's what comes back to that diversity issue that, you know, having some of these stands out there is great, but if that's the only thing you got. You know, people say that, well, I wish I had 500 acres of hardwood stands like this. And I say, well, you really don't. You know, if you have 500 acres, I'd just soon have 50 or 100 of that maybe in the hardwoods and the rest of it is in well-managed upland stands and open field systems. So what is wildlife habitat? That's it right there. That's a good example of it. And it's not the trees necessarily, but it's that ground cover. It's the broom straw, the briars. Uh, you know, this is a long leaf stand in Talladega County we work on. And, uh, you know, and especially in September and October when that broom straw starts turning color, it's gorgeous to look at, it's an open vista. Uh, but it's abundant food source in there as well, and cover. If you talk about having quail, that's, that's the kind of habitat quail have to have. It's not that they, you know, it might be a good idea to have it, or you know, maybe you'll have a couple of quail out there. You know, if you got some hedgerows, this is what they need. They, they don't exist unless they have an abundance of this type of habitat right here. And this is the reason why the forbs, legumes, grasses, wildflowers—those are all good wildlife food plants. They're all good cover plants. They they supply different food items during different seasons of the year, which is required by you know every wildlife species. For instance, turkeys. In the springtime, these these when these pulps start hatching out of the eggs. These poults need insects for about two weeks. The wildflowers and flowers and forbs uh, provide those insects. And uh, without it, you know, without those weedy, grassy type of habitats, you don't have the insects, and therefore the turkey poults and the quail chicks don't have food. They need them for two weeks. That's all they eat for about two weeks is insects. And if you can't find those the, the insect production areas, they're not going to make it. Uh, and then, you know, as the summer progresses, they they feed more on seeds and berries and stuff like that, grapevines and grapes and that type of thing through the summer as the fall progresses, they start switching over to acorns. And as, as the acorns start petering out in the wintertime, they'll start working with beech nuts and whatever else they can find. And, you know, switch back over to spring and they start moving back on to greenery again and, and uh, that type of stuff. So, uh, again, the diversity of, of, you know, food items available for these critters is, is real important. This is one of my favorites. Um, you know, plant like this is beggar weeds. Um, and I use this a lot of times as an indicator plan of how well my habitat is doing. If I walk through the woods in November or December and I get beggar weeds all over my pant, plant, pant legs, I'm pretty pleased. And that's an indicator to me that I've got the habitat quality and the deer aren't eating it all up because deer will eat these things down to the ground. Uh, you know, all the other plants that go along with it are going to be in, you know, in with these plants. But these beggar weeds provide a seed that's available for turkeys and quail and other songbirds. They provide high protein browse all summer long. There's a, about 20 different species of beggar weeds. There's about 100 different species of native legumes. And they all provide a summer browse for deer. 
and uh, like soybeans, 20 something up to 30% protein level all through the summertime. And then by the time fall comes on, they all put a nice little seed on. Some of them are eating early, some of them are eating late in the wintertime. Uh, but these are highly selected by uh, songbirds and deer and turkeys. So I'm looking for plants like this, various wild legumes. That's, that's the kind of thing I'm looking for in that broom straw and briars type of habitat. So what are the techniques we can use to try and develop these things, thinning, burning, uh, obviously tree planting, disking, uh, various places, field boards, head roads, herbicide chopping, we'll talk a little about all these things. But just bear in mind that your timber management has as much to do with these wildlife populations and the forage production and the wildlife habitat than pretty much anything else you do. Uh, you know, while you can have a, a, a you know, an intensely managed timber stand and not grow these understories, you can, your deer can survive on green fields. And, you know, you can have some wildlife out there, but to get abundant high quality wildlife populations, you need abundant high quality wildlife habitat. And timber management is, is really the driving force in there. And this, this, the analogy is just sunlight. You know, if you're growing a garden, you can't grow a garden in a hardwood stand. You're not going to grow your tomatoes and cucumbers. If you're growing wildlife habitat, you can't grow that up under a shady environment too. You need that, you need that summer. Mm -hmm. That's what it's all about. So this is the whole issue right there. Canopy closure, sunlight uh, uh, makes or breaks that wildlife habitat. So talk about timber management. Again, this is a good example of, of things that are strictly timber managed. And don't get me wrong, we've got clients that are straight timber management. They'll take the wildlife populations we get that are an off, offshoot from that, you know, that, that high-end timber management. They're trying to get production of, of pine timber and hardwood timber off the properties, and they'll have some deer and turkeys, and they're happy with that. We also have the other end of the stick, the wildlife folks, to tell you, I don't really care about the timber, I just want my wildlife managed right. And, you know, we generate money off our timber cuts, that's fine. And, you know, manage the timber for what it needs to be managed for, but priority is wildlife. And, and so we're just trying to fit in between both of those, both of those ends. So again, common misconception, pine forest, biological deserts, and the, you know, this, this is the kind of thing that comes from that guy who says, man, I'd love to have 500 acres of mature hard, bottom and hardwood forest, you know? And, and, and I typically say, no, nah, that's really not what you want. Pine forest, they get a bad rap all the time, especially by some other wildlife biologists, you know, oh, it's just pine monoculture. Well, I just soon take a, you know, if somebody brings me a property and says, I want to man manage the wildlife, I just soon take a 20 year old pine stand and start there. Uh, because then I can really work that pine stand to be what I want it to be. And, uh, and you know, so pretty much monocultures of anything are, are typically bad. So uh, logging, that's the first step on these pine forests, you know, loggers are our friends. Uh, they, they, you know, you can adjust that density to what you want it to be uh, and make a little money off it. There's a couple of options of you know thinning options. Now, granted, there's you know huge amount of grades between you know option one and option three. There's a whole lot of ways to, to manage timber stands, but just for visual purposes, here's an example. You got standard thinning practices right here: the residual stand, you know, in a first thin, 15 years old or whatever. Um, you leave about 250, 350 trees per acre left after you thin. Fifth row thin. This is a good example of a fifth row thin. Four rows standing, one row clear cut, that's a 20% initial removal, and then you thin the four rows remaining and just pick some trees out of there that are usually the lower quality trees and kind of thin it up and open it up. There's uh, you know very little visual attraction to stand like that, no wildlife value to speak of. It certainly is better than it was, and, and you're getting some sunlight, but it's not being managed from a wildlife perspective. Then in option two is exactly the other end of the spectrum. Um, this is a good wildlife thin. Um, on this particular stand, we cut it, uh, the stand out on the first thin. It was actually 14 years old, and the guy wanted to hunt quail on the next year, so we cut it to 100 trees per acre. I made very clear to him the risks he was going to take about wind throw and other damage he might encounter. We didn't get any, but you know he knew what he was getting into and, and the reasons I was cautioning him that this might be a little risky operation it worked out very well. But in this case, you know, uh, we thin this stand back to 100 trees per acre. He had birds on the next year because he had places for birds to come from and move into this stand. It was great, great aesthetics and burned through it, uh, cleaned it up real nice. And so, you know, that's kind of the, the wildlife end of that spectrum. And then option three, you know, some nice little compromise in between the two. This is a stand we thinned down to about 130, 140 trees per acre on the first thin. It was a standard old field, you know, straight row lob volley stand. Um, but, you know, we're kind of leaving this one and let it grow up for a couple of years. This will become a wildlife uh, a stand. It's going to be managed actually for quails on a quail place. Um, but, you know, we didn't want to slow the tree's height growth. 
We didn't want to get them, you know, the trees to get limmy and things like that. We want to try and make sure that in the end, 20 years down the road, we had a bunch of good quality trees. And when we did our second thin, we had a lot of good trees to select from and didn't want to encounter the risk of maybe a you know, big wind or hurricane coming through and knocking down a bunch of our timber. So in this case, we thinned that to 130, 140 trees per acre. We got a lot of sunlight you can see on the ground. This was the uh, winter after we thinned, and uh, so there's no vegetation growing yet, but right now it's been burned, and it's, you know, it's got a lot of understory vegetation, nice weedy grassy. It's not thick, it's not a you know, high quantity or quality, but it's a nice, it's a nice uh, a compromise. This was a second thin. Again, I was on a quail deer turkey kind of place. Uh, and uh, you know, started off at 200 trees per acre with old CRP. We did the first thin and cut it down as far as CRP would allow us to, to 200 trees. And then this was the second thin afterwards. We just marked down through it. And that's basically taken from the same spot as this. And this was the residual stand after we got done thinning it at 75 trees per acre on the second thin. And uh, that stand right there, is, you, know, you can see some quail habitat on the left side of this picture, some longleaf and stuff like that. Uh, that's incorporated into our quail area now. <laughs> got it all cleaned up and burned through. So this is what you end up with down the road. This is a mature standard here in the thinning option two. You know, it started off at a, at a lower density and kind of, you know, uh, kept it maintained, burned, thin, uh, frayed, the, the gums and things out, um, and, and you get on a quail deer turkey to that place. So thinning works, it's real important, uh, but obviously it's better with burning. And uh, I'm not going to hit this too hard since I know John had talked about uh, burning and he's a good one to give a prescribed fire talk, but uh, I'm going to get on just a little bit. Uh, this is a, a single photo point over a series of photos over a series of years from this same spot. Uh, this is the stand when we started working with it. And uh, uh, we did a little bit of, of sweet gum spraying in there. It had already been first then and, uh, and we came through and uh, ran a fire through it. And, uh, and here's a, a good example of the, the sunlight effect. This was two years later after we burned that stand, and you can still see what you're getting is a bunch of shrubs and very weak understory vegetation, no broom straw. Um, so, you know, it's just a, a, a much weaker uh, a wildlife stand. And uh, we burned it again, and it came in and, and ran a thin through. You can see the mark trees uh, that we left in this one, the blue mark, and these are the blue mark trees that were left in the same photo point. This was the summer after we thinned and burned. And all of a sudden it's broom straw, it's wild light games, and all this good quality uh, understory forbs. They're out there waiting to be treated right, and, uh, and they'll jump back pretty quick. So burning is highly important uh, for keeping these properties open and maintaining the value of the, the piney woods. Again, talking about the legumes, fire stimulates these good plants. This is a couple of different legumes right here. You can see the deer browse on the, on the uh, bag of wheat on the left. That's a, a, looks like a soybean or something like that on the right, but that's a wild pea. Uh, that just grows in the woods. Obviously, a longleaf, burning can start early in these young longleaf stands. It's also suitable for mixed pine hardwood stands, and it's also suitable for bottoms. We burn right through hardwood bottoms. Be careful, take it slow, burn it when it's cold out, uh, but it doesn't hurt your trees if you're, if you're extremely careful with uh, running the fire through there, and it does have some benefits of cleaning up those stores. Herbicides, this is a good example of, uh, of you know, coming through with a uh, migrant labor, spraying out sweet gums. It's a pretty reasonable investment, $55, $65 an acre to kill your sweet gums out. And, uh, and this is what you end up with afterwards. You know, it's the same stand. Once it's been burned through, this doesn't happen the next year, but this has been burned through about two years later, that's what it looked like. Uh, with a nice, you know, again, that's a fairly heavily stocked stand, but it's got a nice understory of weeds and forbs and grasses, which is what it's looking for. Uh, running woodland vultures, we run a couple of woodland vultures. Uh, this is our bigger one. Um, I'm cleaning up stumps right here in this case. And uh, this is a good example, again, from a single photo point. This was a mixed pine hardwood stand that, uh, that we wanted to clean out a lot of those saplings and the junk out of there. We ran the mulcher through it. That's what it looked like in the same photo point after we ran the mulcher through it. All right? And, uh, and, and got it all cleaned up, got the stuff mulched on the ground, ran a fire through it. That's what it looked like the summer afterwards. It's kind of a post oak you know, a little bit of long leaf scattered through it, but, uh, but a, a very nice stand. And again, opening it up for that, you know, vista. Landowner has a tree stand uh, on a green field just around the corner up there. You'd love to sit in there where you can see off through the woods, you know, watch deer walking through that stuff. Uh, hardwood management, what I got, about three minutes? Uh, hardwood management, I'll hit on this real quick. Uh, talk about some of the problems with that. It's a shady environment in most cases. That doesn't mean you can't grow some wildlife habitat and hardwood stands as well. This is a good example of coming through and, and uh, uh, doing a thinning operation in a, in a fairly mature, about 70 year old uh, hardwood stand. It had some scattered pine through it, was in a bottom land on the river bottoms. 
uh, uh, area. And, uh, and you can see on the ground, again, trying to maintain that understory vegetation. If it comes back up and solid oak sprouts and sweet gum sprouts, you're not doing yourself any favors. They're sucking up sunlight, too, without giving you any benefits. So you got to get rid of those understory. In this case, we spray garlon on the ground and get those saplings out of there. We're not trying to regenerate our stand in, in, in this case. We're trying to grow a little bit of understory habitat. Problem is, you open up hardwoods too much and you start getting that apartment branching and you can start damaging the value of those high quality hardwoods. So you just got to be careful with that. But you can see this is still a pretty shady stand, high quality hardwood trees in there, and we're still growing a little bit of understory vegetation. Um, and this is always a good example. It's not a good hardwood stand, it's going to be great pine stand. In this case, the landowner just lets pines die out slowly but surely and said, I like hardwoods. So why don't you just get some money for those pines instead of just letting them fall on the ground, you know, and get them cleaned up. Uh, and what comes back is not that high quality. So uh, I got just a minute or two. Uh, if anybody have any questions?